Mann are joining us right now. Great pleasure to welcome to our show today, Mann, who has uh, co-written a very interesting book and a very uh, timely book as well. It's called Rescue America. Our best America is only one generation away. And uh, incidentally, it just made, uh, as Chris told me before we went on the air, the a New York Times bestseller list. And Chris Salomon joins us today from uh, opposite the uh, coast of us here in Sarasota in Delray Beach. How are you, Chris? I'm doing just great, Doug. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, good to have a chance to uh, to talk to you. And I had a chance to read through the book uh, over the weekend. And, uh, and I like your premise. I think a lot of people out there are feeling the way you do. Uh, I guess putting it down on paper and uh, from the success, like you mentioned, it's on the bestseller list already. I think you've touched a nerve. Yeah, I, th I think so. You know, and the idea of the book was really to uh, sort of take a little different approach. Uh, you know, there's two primary premises of, of the book, and it's a very different uh, analysis that's been done or what's been talked about or any books that are sort of out there. And basically, the, the first premise is that, that the, the book makes, I believe, an irrefutable connection between a very specific set of values, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as set forth in our Declaration of Independence, and a set of principles, um, and, and the connection between those values and principles and the unparalleled prosperity that America has experienced over the last 235 years. So, so the book first lays out the case that, you know, it's not a particular policy. Uh, it's not a set of policies that have made America the greatest, most prosperous nation in the history of the world. But what caused that was a very specifically designed set of values by the founding fathers and then a set of driving, driving principles, and those principles being the principle of gratitude, the principle of personal responsibility, and the principle of sacrifice. So those being the, the values and principles that made America the greatest, most prosperous nation. So, of course, having, having pinpointed that as the, as the problem, Problem, right. Uh, the second premise of the book is that the, the common discourse right now, the arguments that are being bantered back and forth, make a fundamental mistake. And, it, and that mistake is that they, they substitute or confuse effects of America's decline with the true cause of our decline. So, you know, what I hear when I turn on any news channel is argument about, well, this policy is wrong or that policy is wrong. Well, it's this president's fault. No, it's the prior president's fault. Right. And all of those are correct. Certainly, those are absolutely effects of America's great decline. But I argue in the book that the cause of the decline is that for the better part of 60 years, we have not transferred from one generation to the next those very values and principles that I mentioned as the first premise of the book, and rather we've replaced those uh, with a culture of entitlement and a culture of complaint. Yeah, you talk in the book, uh, reading about your your, your great-grandparents uh, who came over from Italy, my grandparents uh, uh, from Canada, but I mean, I think everybody has a story like that, and they came here with little or, or nothing and, and made made whatever they made out of their life, uh, out of those three principles you just mentioned right there. And for some reason, uh, somewhere a lot of people made the wrong turn there and expect uh, everything's going to be handed to them, and uh, that, that, that's, that's a bad road to go down, isn't it? It really is, and, and uh, you know, what you find is you're right. That story is not unique. I tell the story for that very reason, because I think everyone who has read about my great-grandparents coming here, uh, they have the same reaction. They have someone in their family or someone they know that had a similar experience. You know, they, they, these, these early immigrants, they did not, you know, they didn't board 747s and sit mimosas and land at JFK and take a taxi to the Ritz-Carlton, right? They, they boarded the hulls of ships that took weeks, sometimes months, to traverse the ocean. Ocean and to come across, uh, you know, this this big pond for the hope of something better, right? There was no promise. There was no job waiting for them at Google. There was no 401k plan. There was no health insurance. What there was was just a different set of values that said, in America, you have this unbelievable privilege. You have the privilege to rise to whatever level you can rise to, to succeed to the greatest lengths that mankind has ever known, or to fail flat on your face but to get back up again and try again. And that's been the beauty of America. When, when people know they can fall down, they can get back up, but when they do succeed, that the fruits of that labor and of their, of their hard work are their own and that no government's going to just take it from them, uh, that, that inspires people to achieve great things. And, and unfortunately, uh, you know, when, 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 that's tr when that's 
taken away and suddenly the culture becomes one not of what I need to do, what I need to take responsibility for, what I have to sacrifice in order to achieve, but rather what I'm entitled to. So I, I tell the story in the book of my great-grandparents because the story is when they landed, and again, not unique, my great-grandfather got on his knees and he kissed the ground at Ellis Island right. because his first instinct was an instinct of gratitude. And when you begin your, your journey in life, from a place of gratitude, it changes the whole paradigm. I mean, imagine a different kind of citizen, a different kind of employee, for, for the different kind of politician we would have if the first place people came from is not what I'm entitled to, but rather what I am grateful for, right? So, so when I say the cause is, is a, a failure to transfer these values, we would have different policies if we had different Americans, different citizens. Well, well what do you think it is, Chris, or, or when do you think... Uh... The, the attitude, and I'm not saying everybody changed, but I mean enough to obviously kind of put us in a situation that the country is in right now with, you know, kind of the two sides of this. So where do you think this began? Do we know? Or? Sure, yeah, I think we do know. And, and you know, the thing is, this is not a matter of, I don't believe in this, in the, in the, the fault game, right? It's this person's fault or it's or the blame game. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of responsibility, and there's a difference between fault and responsibility. And, and where this sort of digression began to happen, I think, is right after the, the uh, World War II generation, right, the sort of the baby boomers, uh, where, you know, my great-grandparents and my grandparents, they struggled every day. They didn't have any of these entitlements. They didn't have these safety nets that were in place to make sure that, that you know, if they fell down, somebody was there to catch them and tell them it's okay, and somehow, you know, failure has become politically incorrect in America. So what happened is we had a, a generation of people who said, we struggled so much, when life was so hard, but we made something better for ourselves, and we finally made it, so we're going to make things better for our children. And in that noble idea of having a better life for our children and our children's children and our children's children's children, in that noble idea came this sort of philosophy that we're going to take away the pains, we're going to take away the, the challenges and the difficulties of life. And when you begin to do that and remove these obstacles that are the very things that make people uh, uh, successful, that make people, uh, that challenge them to become more and to grow more. In every movie that we see on, tele uh, on television or in the movie theater that inspires us is the story of someone who struggled and overcame that struggle and yet achieved. Right? We never go watch movies of somebody who was born, they were given everything, everything went perfect for them, and their life just went fine. Right? Nobody wants to see that no. movie. That's not, that's, not, that's not America. So I think that's how it happened, and incrementally, little by little, and, and as people began to feel more like, I don't need, I'm in an, I'm an America, I don't need to suffer. I don't need to have any kind of a, a, a challenge in my life. And I don't remember the gentleman's name, but there was a study done recently, uh, and, and this gentleman concluded that, you know, America is just, you know, after the tsunami in Japan, we're not really, we're not equipped for suffering. Mm. And that's a, that's a very, very uh, scary proposition when you think, you know, you look at the tsunami, and I watch these people standing in line quietly, respectfully, waiting for water, waiting for necessities. Um, you know, no one was rioting, no one was jumping over the person who was in front of them. And I wonder, I do want to ask myself, what would we do? Are we equipped for that kind of suffering? Yeah, I, I, just from my experience, you know, watching news or talking to people or just watching people, I, I think a lot of folks now give up too quickly quickly you know they, they, they uh, where, where that's not the american spirit there you know they, something goes wrong or i give up and walk away whereas i think that also uh, adds to this too right i mean give up let somebody else uh, you know save me and that, that, that's the wrong attitude there's no question you know it began with the when the founders uh you know, they were very learned men, studied a lot of philosophy, and, you know, one of the philosophers was a gentleman named Adam Smith, who wrote something, uh, you know, very profound, and he, he said, you know, hundreds of years ago, the natural effort of every individual to better his own condition is so powerful of a principle that it's capable of carrying on a society to wealth and prosperity. And, you know, that was repeated, really, by, by Abraham Lincoln, who I know both our current president and other presidents, everybody likes to, you know, refer to past presidents and say how they're like them. But, you know, Abraham Lincoln, in a, in a sort of a speech he gave in, I think it was like 1856 or something, uh, sort of an obscure speech, he said something very profound. He said, and I call it in the book, I call it the Lincoln Proposition. 
What he said is the man who labored for another last year, this year, can labor for himself. And next year, he can hire others to work for him. Mm. That's the American dream, right? We don't, we don't mock, we don't envy in America other people who are successful. When we work for someone else, we don't envy them. We want to emulate them. Right? We want to become that. We want to strive to be better so that today while I work for somebody, tomorrow I can work for myself. Maybe someday I can have other people work for me. That's what built America into the greatest and most prosperous nation in the world. Mm. Are you optimistic, uh, Chris? Uh, I mean, uh, well, we've seen you know, the opposite of Tea Party, and, you know, that movement is there, but uh, how do you feel? Yeah, you know, I, I have mixed I have mixed feelings on it. I'm optimistic, and I wrote the book from an optimistic standpoint. You know, I tried to, I sort of juxtaposed the subtitle of the book, which is Our Best America is Only One Generation Away, mm -hmm. which is a very positive subtitle, and I, I sort of juxtaposed that with the very first line of the book, which is a quote from Ronald Reagan, which says that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Right. So, you know, the two things are true, right? We're, we're only one generation from extinction, but we're also only one generation from our best America. And so my, my history of teaching children for 20 years and teaching leadership to, to young people, to teenagers, what I see is minds that can be molded and can be shaped. But the reality is, no matter what we are doing, whatever we are teaching and and equally important, whatever we're not teaching is influencing and in some way indoctrinating our children. And the answer to America renewing its greatness is through the next generation and the generation after that. So my book proposes a solution which evolves around uh, future generations, starting with early childhood development programs and, and sort of a national priority, having it, having national service announcements that encourage parents to begin to instill these uh, values and principles early on because we know from, from, from research that by the time a child reaches seven years old, their, their attitudes, their worldview, um, the principles they understand are, are already embedded. They're actually woven into the fabric of their brain, so we have to start early. Secondly, we have to revamp our school systems. There is, there's no question that, that we are lagging behind. I just watched uh, Bill Bennett, former Secretary of Education on television, talking about the fact that if, uh, if, we, if we got rid of the bottom 10% of teachers, the worst 10%, you know, sort of like the old GE model, right? Mm -hmm. GE always got to let the bottom 10 go and constantly replace them. If we did that in teaching, it would represent over the lifetime of those, of those students coming up through the ranks $100 trillion in, in earnings over the course wow. of the future generations. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a dramatic change and a dramatic shift in the trajectory of the nation. So, so I, I propose, you know, what I call a capstone course. For some reason, this idea of, of teaching Americans values and patriotism has become somehow politically incorrect and unpopular in America. But again, it's, it's like a company that, you know, I call it the paradox of prosperity in the book. You know, if you take a company who, who becomes very successful and they rise and they keep growing, and then suddenly, and it's a natural paradox, without a discipline and without vigilance, what happens to most companies is they begin to forget and move away from the very things that they did in the first place to make them successful. And then they wonder why they're declining. And that's what's happened to America, right? We're suffering from the paradox of prosperity. We became so prosperous, we thought it was somehow just a right we had to be that way, as opposed to the result of a very specific set of principles, values, and conduct. Uh, and and we're, we're caught in that paradox right now. And the only way out of it is to begin with our young people to teach them that, that greatness is not, is not something you inherit. Greatness is not something what we inherited was an atmosphere was a set of values that allow us to achieve greatness if we are vigilant and we abide by and we live by and we instill those values in ourselves. The name of the book is Rescue America. Our best America is only one generation away. We've been talking with uh, Chris Salamone uh, today. And Chris, uh, have you got a website? People can get a hold of the book or get a hold of yes, you? Yes, absolutely. It's available in bookstores nationwide, airports, uh, on Amazon.com, and also at our own website, RescueAmericaBook.com. And uh, just so your listeners know, all the proceeds from the book are being donated to the Wounded Warrior Project. Oh, great. Yeah, it's a worthwhile organization. And Chris, I appreciate you taking a few minutes uh, today. We look forward to talking to you maybe sometime next year with uh, the elections coming up. I'm sure uh, we'll uh, cross paths again then, but uh, congratulations so far on the success. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate it. Thank you.